Good morning, students. I'm Professor Franklin. And if you are taking my class, I would like for you to please start this lecture by answering these questions, these eight questions, and sending me an email to introduce yourself so I can begin to get to know you. When we talk about art appreciation and art history, especially from the standpoint of looking at all of human history, like we will in this class, art appreciation, we are zooming back to the beginning of time, the development of humanity. And there's two foundational ideas I like to step into this with, and that is what is written here. The first, this idea that no society has lived without some form of art. So pause and think about that, what that means that as humans became civilized, as we transitioned from early man to homo sapiens, our ancestors, we always had some form of art. And the second idea that this longing to make images and the skills that come with the ability to make images is something that is unique to humans. When you think about yourself as a child, and I know not all of us are artistically inclined, but almost all of us had this draw to coloring or doodling or drawing. When we think about our early days in preschool and kindergarten, and even in those early grade levels, it was something that was just integrated into our daily lives. And at some point that kind of just becomes less and less important as we go up through the years in education. Uh, many, including me, think that's very unfortunate. But we all had this impulse, this artistic impulse, as young children, or at least many of us did. If you are taking my class, you likely clicked on a video link in an assignment in our course portal in our Art Appreciation or Art History Online class. And what you're going to do now is get out a piece of paper that you will take some notes on, and at the end of this you'll submit uh, that, a picture of that paper to our course link. What I'd like for you to do at the top of that paper is to jot down as many different artists as you can think of off the top of your head. It's super important that you don't cheat on this. I want you to just kind of dig into your known background knowledge. And as you'll see shortly, you have a lot more background knowledge than you think you do about art. So you can go ahead and pause this video and just take a minute or two and jot down as many visual artists. So these are artists that make art, not musicians, but visual artists that you can think of. Next, I'd like for you to please watch this video. If you either go to YouTube and search for this name, or you can uh, click in the description section just below this for the video link. It's called 70 Million by a band called Hold Your Horses. And it should be the version that also displays the original art next to it. So it's not the original music video from the band. And what I want you to do is, as you watch this video, put a little tally mark or check mark on your paper every time you see an image you recognize. Now, those images will repeat. You don't need to put a second tally mark. So every time you see a fresh image that somewhere in your background knowledge you know you've seen, this is something that might have been used in an advertisement, maybe a piece of art that is you know, on the wall of your dentist's office. We have such strong visual input from so many different places advertisements, puzzles. So you'll put a little tally mark and then as the next image comes up that you recognize, put another tally mark. Now you have two different sections you've completed on your notes to be handed in to me. At the top you have a certain number, maybe you only have two, maybe you have 15 different artists you could think of off the top of your head. Please Write how many you had. If you had two, put a two with a circle around it. If you had 10, great, 10 with a circle. Now please tally up your tally marks so you can count. Again, if you just had a couple, uh, sometimes students are able to recognize almost all of them. I think there's about two dozen fresh images there. And what I'm hoping you're seeing between those numbers, the discrepancy between those numbers, is that you know a lot more about art already than you think you do that we are saturated by input, by this visual input, and we are storing this information even though we might not have the language to talk about it. The first term I want to present to you for this class is a concept called formal elements. 
So this is, if we are looking at a painting, these are the decisions the artist makes in order to create that painting. So are they painting a tree? How big or small is the tree? So things to do with proportion and scale would fall into formal elements. The size of what it is, the color, shape, texture, what it is, a tree, a person. None of these things are the storytelling component. That's a concept called iconography that we'll be visiting shortly. But these are the specific minute or giant decisions an artist makes while they are painting or drawing a piece of art. If you're in my online class, this is a piece of activity we might do together during our first class. Um, this class that I teach is run in many, many different formats. But in general, just take a moment now and I'd like for you to answer this question, what is art? What is art? And you can do this by giving me a single sentence definition or maybe a list of a couple things that kind of fall into this category of art. So take a moment, pause this video, and answer this question, what is art? I'm sure many of you came up with some definition involving emotions and expression, at least in my 10, 11 years of teaching this class and asking this question. That's what a lot of students come back with. Maybe some of you listed different things. What is art? Art is poetry and music and paintings and sculpture and tattoos and graffiti art. And maybe you came up with a list that kind of encompassed many of the different subjects or disciplines of art. Now here, I just want you to take a minute and think about something that isn't art. What falls outside of this category of art? And this might be a little more challenging than that first question. What is included in the categories and the idea of creating art? Or what is art? There are a few more terms we're going to be foundation building with in this particular class, our introduction to these concepts of art that'll help carry us through quite a bit of the rest of our semester. We talked about formal elements a few slides ago. This slide is talking about a concept which you're probably all familiar with, is the idea of a timeline. So on a timeline, you can see a timeline stretching in both directions in infinity, that's the idea. And right in the middle of that is a transition between BC and AD. And that date, or those dates from a historical context, that was the birth of Christ. And in this class, we're going to talk about a lot of different religions and how they tie in together and echo each other's stories. But we use, in the world we live in here in North America, we use the Gregorian calendar. And that is based on this supposed historical event. So before the birth of Christ, we talk about that by saying BC, and you can think about this timeline, and on the left side of it, you will see the pyramids and the Greeks and the beginning of the Romans. And then on the right side, we have Rome and Christianity picking up and coming into the modern era. So you can choose to use either BC AD or BCE CE, whichever you're most comfortable with when you write about uh, art in our discussion boards, that is completely up to you. We're going to make our first attempt at talking and describing a piece of art. And the beginning of doing that is working with formal elements, those building block observations that are going to help carry us into talking deeper about art as we build in our course time together. When we talk about formal elements, remember those are the decisions the artist has made. Those are things like proportion and subject and color and texture and shapes and um, anything else that can describe this world we're peeking into of the layers that are on this canvas and where the artist has chosen to put objects. I like to begin by asking you to look with a level of detail in this an image like this like you would be describing it to someone that couldn't see so someone is sitting next to you and you need to describe this image one of the ways i find it's it's easy to do that is to kind of take the specific overall composition out and almost read it like a newspaper start in one corner 
work your way back and forth across. And when you do that, you're sometimes able to see a higher level of detail. In this case, the white neutral background with some texture on it, his spiky hair as I work my way across, and then come back to the beginning, like you're coming to the next line of text. So please pause this presentation and take a few moments to sit and describe, describe in detail. Now you're not necessarily talking about this character, who he might be, anything like that. We're going to get to that in a few slides. But right now you're just describing as much as you can of the image. Try to leave as, as little out as possible. Go into as much detail as possible. And again, you're doing this in your notes you're going to be handing in to me. This image is something called a portrait. You can get down that in your notes as well. And in particular, it's a type of portrait called a self-portrait. This is an image of oneself. So this artist, his name is Vincent van Gogh, or Vincent van Gogh is probably the pronunciation you're used to. He has chosen to paint himself this way. He painted this in 1888. This was right on the tail of a period of time called Impressionism. He was an artist that fell into this group we now call the Post-Impressionists. This image is how he wanted us to see him these 130 years later. He knew we would be looking at this image. He always had a mindset that he was going to be a great artist, even though he struggled and really was not successful during his own life. He had this certainty or this hope for this legacy that we now have of him. So the next thing I want you to jot down about is please tell me why he chose to paint himself this way. Why are we seeing him this way? You might remember this image, surely a piece of background information or background knowledge. This is something that is so widely popular, so used in advertising and different memes. This is a painting called Starry Night or Starry Starry Night, also by the same artist, Vincent van Gogh. And as we come back to looking at Van Gogh, his self-portrait from 1888, I want you to take notice of this swirling skyline. As we come back to look at this image, you can see that swirling, beautiful, starry night painted in the sky in our last slide, reflected in his jacket here. Another foundational term that really goes hand in hand with the idea of formal elements is this idea of iconography. And that is the study of symbols or messages in an image. Sometimes those symbols and messages might have to do with the period of time for an image that we're looking at. We'll see a little bit later a painting by Jean Van Eck that the different colors in it and the placement of the dog in it and the candle on the chandelier all those things had something very specific to tell us. But it also can be just as simple as us knowing maybe a little bit about the artist's life, the universal images, the universal messages that come through in art. So when we come back to look at this image here, we can start to piece together more information about this character. So I asked you why he might want to show himself this way. I hope that many of you saw that he had his painting tools in his hand. And I told you that for him, being a painter and being a good painter, a painter that had some sort of legacy, was very important to his core belief systems, his heart. And so he, of course, is showing himself as a painter. He's choosing for that to be the legacy that's carried down these hundred and change years later. Now, he's sitting in front of a canvas and Art historians have looked at his palette, that's the thing that's held on his hand that um, is able to conveniently hold his paint and his paintbrushes. They carry a lot of the colors that are in this image. So it's thought playfully that if we flipped that canvas around, we'd be looking at a painting of him painting himself, which I think is funny. It's kind of like one of those um, three-way mirrors in a dressing room maybe where you can kind of see yourself in infinity in the mirrors. 
he also signed this in an interesting place and i'm hoping i get to see that reflected in some of your formal elements observations he chose to sign this on the back of a canvas and i know again we're new to talking about art but I'm sure a lot of you can imagine when you look at a painting or a photograph the artist generally signs and dates it in the bottom corner traditionally the bottom right hand corner but for him, again, reinforcing that the most important thing about himself is that he is an artist as a character. He has signed this painting on the back of the painting he's painting. This is a very different self-portrait. This is an artist named Albert Dorer. He is most known for his printmaking uh, imagery that we will look at a little later in the semester. He carved wood, wood block prints that were incredibly detailed, incredibly beautiful. Now, let's start by pausing this video, and I'd like for you to do your formal elements observations. Remember the decisions the artist makes. What's dominant? What colors are dominant? What shapes are dominant? What's interesting about how close or far away we are? So pause and just jot down maybe eight or ten different observational things there. And again, moving left and right, think about the direction the light's coming in. Think about the texture. Think about the positioning of the character. So pause this, just take a couple, you know, 30, 60 seconds to just look at this and jot down as much as you can. Now I want you to think about that second question. This is another self-portrait. This is how the artist chose to present himself. Why do you think he's showing us this? What is he showing us? Look at where his hand is. What is his hand drawing attention to? And you should be able to hopefully zoom in on the YouTube video or have your YouTube video full screen in order to be able to see this in any detail. Or you can search for this image if you want to pause this and search for one of the Google Arts and Cultures images. That will be a very, very high resolution image that you can kind of zoom in and move around. So looking at what his hand is drawing attention to, where he signed this image. How is he presenting himself? Anyone that's familiar with Christian art from let's say the last six or 700 years, icon paintings, thinking about that, thinking about what type of character, whose role is he playing here? So again, pause and you can just jot down a little bit like what is this character we're seeing? When we take a photo sit for a photo, have a school photo taken, maybe a sports photo taken. How and what character are we in when we do that? And I would imagine that most of us have many different guises or characters we've stepped into in those in the images and the ways we present ourselves to the world. So maybe me as a professional in my professional outfit or me with my family or in my garden or doing one of the hobbies that I love. So he's choosing to show himself in a certain way. I'm sure you can see how those ideas tie into this concept of iconography we are developing. So the symbols in an image that we can translate to help put together a story. So in this case, maybe you jotted down what was important to him. Why is he showing us this, this image of himself? Why is this the reflection we are seeing of him? This is, we're looking at a painting that is 500 years old, and this is the legacy he wanted us to have. So we see that he is very serious. He's showing himself there's no joy or smile or levity. He's shown by himself. In the top left-hand corner, you can see that he has a monogram there. So his initials, Albert Dorer, in a nice, neat little um, square or rectangle with the date and on the right hand side it's a very formal very flowery signing that Albert Dorer painted this painting in this year he has his hand touching the fur trim drawing a lot of attention to that hand you can see his face and his hand are lit up the contrast of light and dark of his face versus the background that is something called chiaroscuro it's a word I won't have you write that down yet we're going to be visiting that word shortly but just so you can begin to be familiar with some of these terms chiaroscuro is the contrast the sharp contrast of light against dark so he's drawing attention to his face drawing his attention to his hand his hand is touching his fur on his shirt reminding us that he's wealthy and if this is his legacy as a painter the idea is that 
maybe he's trying to let us know that he's successful, that he's been successful as an artist, creating this incredibly frontal image, the likeness of many images we see from Christ from this period of time. So he's likening himself also to the image of Christ, which is quite a bold statement to make as an artist. So when we look at these two images side by side, we're going to begin to develop language to talk about similarities and differences in art. So for what I'd like for you to do now is please just take about 60 seconds, 90 seconds, and jot down maybe five or six similarities and five or six differences that you see in this type of work of art. How are these artists showing themselves similarly? What have they done that is akin to each other and what is vastly different in their presentation of themselves. Portraiture and self-portraiture is something that dates back thousands of years. You can see this 3,500 year old gold mask from a Greek site called Mycenae. This was found in a deep burial shaft. There were several other masks that looked similar to this. This one in particular, they call the Mask of Agamemnon. Um, we don't actually believe this was the great King Agamemnon's mask, but sometimes uh, early archaeologists liked to assign stories for things like this, just kind of in, in order to create a bit more hype or interest or just sometimes a total uh, ignorance of, of the real facts or the real timeline of history as, as we develop and understand history. So this idea of creating the likeness of someone, these masks that we found, every single one carries a different face. So we are certain with a very high level of belief that this is a particular person's face that we are seeing these thousands of years later. The little beady eyes, the kind of thin and long drawn nose, the pursed lips, the big beard, the Dumbo ears out to the side that this is a reflection we are gazing into see the face of someone that lived very long before us. You've all likely heard the term archaeology and I just want to take a moment to touch on what this word means. It's from a combination of two old worlds, archaeos and logos, meaning old beginnings and the word. So it's the study of these old beginnings. Archaeology um, spelled one of two different ways, I prefer the first spelling of it, is the study of human activity through the recovery and analysis of material culture. That's a flowery way of saying that archaeology is the concept of going into the ground and finding what's there. When you dig down and dig deeper and deeper down, you're going further and deeper into history. So we have something called the archaeological record, and this is a record that consists of things like artifacts, architecture, so you can imagine the great Greek temples and structures and the Roman basilicas and things just like finding potentially arrowheads, uh, projectile points or grinding stones in the ground here where we live in a, a region uh, where the indigenous culture left a great number of artifacts. Things like ecofacts and cultural landscapes, how these early peoples might have shaped or changed the land that they lived on. This is an archaeology site. You can see the archaeologists working in small meter areas. The deeper they get, the older things are, and they try to work in as orderly of a fashion as possible because they're trying to recreate the story. They're trying to understand why things are there how the different artifacts they're finding in different areas of a site are relating to each other. When we look at the image on the right, this is a painting by Jean Venet from 1410. We can talk about this through many different lenses. You can think of us as putting on different glasses to see art through. The first two we've spoken about already, and these are going to really be the foundation that we move through in this class, the idea of iconography, study of symbols and underlying stories of the art, formalism or the study of formal elements. We can also look at this through a lens of feminism, taking into account the lives and the circumstances of women. And as we come up into more modern periods of time, viewing women's art through the lens of what the experiences are to be a woman and to create art from that lens. We often will kind of 
move back and forth between iconography and these next two, almost seamlessly, biography and psychoanalysis. So we can look at something through the lens of what we know about an artist. So for example, we knew Jean Van Eyck was a very devoted Catholic. A lot of his imagery surrounds ideas to do with Catholicism. Psychoanalysis, how does an image like this tell us about the insides, the feelings, emotions, experiences that an artist has had? I often will try to integrate contemporary art, no matter what period of time or subject we're talking about. And today I want to introduce you to an artist named John Baldessari. And at the end of this video uh, that you'll see the link to in our comment section or uh, description section just below this video, at the end, John Baldessari gives every young artist three things they should know. And I want you to make sure to jot those down as part of your notes you're submitting to me if you're on my online class. I think those three things he suggests are something that echo into our lives, even if we're not artists, this idea that we should be filled with passion for anything we do moving forward in life. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my lecture. If you are in any of my online classes, I look forward to seeing you on our next Zoom call. And if you were just here to learn a bit more about art appreciation, thanks for taking the time to uh, stop and watch this. And I hope to see all your faces soon.